Well, the special holiday edition of the drive through continues right now. Here's the host and star of the show, Mr. Jim Cornette. Hey, wait, what? you're doing this again? I thought we already uh, determined that you're not palming this thing off on me. Let's play some guess the program. You want to? Oh, you want me since to go, it's my show? You want me to go grab some and try to see what I could do to? No, I don't need you to grab any right now because I'm gonna flip the script again on you. Wild card is, I've got some more here for you because people enjoyed apparently listening to you twist in the wind trying to figure things out. You, the big expert, the big know-it-all, the big blabbermouth. Last time I did this, you wanna, you wanna try it again? Are you accepting my challenge? I don't have a, a WrestleMania sign to. I'm pointing on one of the the programs hanging on my wall. You wanna accept the challenge? Yeah, I'll accept any challenge. You know that. And by the way, I did pretty good last time, from what I remember. And that was what you said. You said I did pretty good. Well, you missed a year once. I did several times. I did uh, it every time. I don't think I got the year right <laughs> once last time. <laughs> Well, I got a couple here, just a few. I'm going to start you with an easy one. See, this way we get to talk about wrestling without having to watch television. An easy one. Milo of Croton (laughs) versus a rock. Versus Jesus Christ. Okay. (laughs) First match. I'm telling you, this is an easy one. First match. Tony Morelli versus Dick Beyer. Second match. Don... Badelman versus Count Billy Varga. Now, let me stop and just say, because people like when we kind of explain what we're thinking. Uh huh. The first thought, perhaps the lazy thought, although perhaps the right thought, just based off the first two matches listed, would be Buffalo. You would think it has to be Buffalo. It has to be upstate New York. Well, and tell the people why you would think that. Dick Beyer, of course. Legendary wrestler out of Syracuse would become the destroyer, Dr. X, to the fans in the Midwest. Don Beetleman from the Buffalo area is the future Don Curtis, who would settle as far away from Buffalo as he could in Jacksonville, Florida. And become the promoter there after his wrestling days. That's right. And the third and But Billy final. Varga, but Count oh. Billy Varga was a big star ah. in various places and specifically was a known wrestler off TV in LA. You are correct there. He was. And the main event, two out of three falls, no time limit. Kokichi Indo and Ricky Dozan versus Gene Kaniski and Lord James Bleers. So it has to be Los Angeles because of Bleers. Bleers wasn't working, I don't think. Northeast and not, I was about to say independent shows, Jesus Christ. Northeast dates in the early 60s. Although, Ricky Dozan, it could be earlier. No. I'm not going to go too early. Oh, no, wait, Dick Beyer, though. When Ricky Dozan was in L.A., he would have already been the destroyer there. So it can't be Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. The worm is turning. Who's Blears' partner again? Gene Kaniski. Buffalo 56. Ooh. April 15, 1956. <clears throat> you said Buffalo, New York? Yeah. You're only 5,500 miles off. Oh. The Civic Auditorium in Honolulu, Hawaii. God damn. What's the date? April 15, 1956, Billy Varga was in from California. Yeah. Kaniski, because of Bleers, he knew Ganya. Kaniski was hot in the Midwest, and he was obviously booked at that point in time or somewhere around that point in time in, uh, in Honolulu to, uh, to work w- on top with Lord Bleers and Ricky Dozan. That's the biggest giveaway that I'm kicking myself over, because when the fuck did he work upstate New York? Never. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You got, uh, Beyer and Curtis got you off kilter. That got me the year. Dick Beyer is what got me the year. It was actually a combination of Dick Beyer, not so much Don Curtis, but Kaniski. It was those two, just thinking about 
names they used on cards and where they would be in age. That got me to 56. But it also got me to the other side of the world. I so thought I that would be easy for Hawaii and Brian. That's why I warmed you up with an easy one. Well, you know, one of the issues that people beloved by the Hawaiians like myself deal with is the lack of Hawaiian wrestling history that's readily available before Ed Francis. And I think this is a problem that hopefully we can cure one day. You and your people. My people. They've accepted me as one of their own. I'm, one right, of the, I'm their people. Let's try another one. You're, if, if your people can back you up on this. The first match, Jack Bentz versus Ivor Barrett. Second match, the Russian Crusher versus Little Eagle. Third match, Lenny Montana versus, and this is a misprint, and you'll know Rito Carrion. Okay. <laughs> instead of Tito Carrion. Right. Plus, the Von Brauners versus Joe Scarpa and. This one, because it's they're listed as Scarpa and Curtis. This one could be Jack Curtis Sr. Uh, of the the Coke and Curtis family. Or Which makes it, sense, because I'm thinking already, just in terms of who's there, the fact that the Von Brauners and Joe Scarpa, the future Jay Strongbow, are on the same show, it's putting it in the South. So I know it's somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line. The question is where? Now, Scarpa... My first thought is Buddy Fuller. That was one of his guys. So it's either Buddy Fuller or his dad. Now his dad, well, unfortunately... I, that ain't the main event now. You okay. don't have to go all the way. There's one more match. One more match for a certain kind of championship that will not be... It could either be a giveaway or it could be a fucking red herring. But it's for a title. Dick the Bruiser versus Freddie Blassie. So there you have it. You have, besides the first two preliminaries, Lenny Montana versus Tito Carrion, the Von Brauners versus Scarpa and Curtis, and Bruiser versus Blassie. Jesus Christ. Would you give me a Louisville program again? I don't think so. Although Blassie... I would, but this ain't it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> And by the way, thank you, John Cosper, for sending me the Louisville history book that he just reissued and expanded. Bluegrass Brawlers. Check it out wherever you find your favorite websites. EatSleepWrestle.com. That's it. So it's not that, though. So read that book to find out about everything but this show. <laughs> Lenny Montana being there, you know, Luca Brasi and The Godfather. Most people think of him as a Northeast guy. Uh-oh, I bring up Lenny Montana. Let's find out who's on the phone. <laughs> Thankfully, it was nobody. But Lenny Montana, the Von Brauners, did you say with Saul Weingroff? It does not say. Is his photo in the program? It, it, this is a sheet. It just has the... It's a sheet. So you're breaking the rules of the actual game just to try no, to... No, it's, it's, it's a program sheet. It's a lineup. It's not an entire... Not a program. A lineup from the program. You're a cheater. Okay. I get it. <laughs> But the Von Brauners, I'm going to assume Saul Weingroff, because why not? It's a fair assumption, wouldn't you say? I would say. I'm going to, I don't have it, so I'm just going to make a wild guess. Okay. Nashville, 1961. Ooh, you are very close on the year, June 29, 1962. Hmm. And I'm surprised that Blassie and Bruiser didn't do it for you. Atlanta, Georgia, the City Auditorium, June 29, 1962. Son of a bitch. And this was for the world heavyweight title. Because at that point, Fred Blassie was the WWA champion in California. A title that Dick the Bruiser would later lay a claim to, I guess is the best way to put it, and yes. make his own. And when they, when California stopped recognizing the WWA because they rejoined the NWA, it didn't matter because Bruiser already had his own WWA title over in Indiana. But yes, June 29, 1962, Atlanta, Georgia. Of course, Fred Blassie, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of kids today may just think of him as the old man manager or may have heard about him and John Tolis 
Not a lot of people talk about what a big star he was in Atlanta for years. That he was. They brought the, him back in like 72 during the war, didn't they? Yeah. Yes. Fred Blassie in the late 50s and through the 60s was like the Stone Cold Steve Austin or in, in WWF or Dusty Rhodes in Florida or a Von Eric. He was the guy, the babyface, right before Ray Gunkel in, in the Georgia Territory. And at one point there in the 60s, he. It was the kidney operation, right? Yeah, I believe he, so. He, he lost one of his kidneys and had to retire from wrestling uh, for like a year, year and a half, and opened up a uh, a car lot among a couple of other businesses there because of his notoriety in Atlanta. And he would be advertised in the wrestling program with his venture, with his see Freddie for a car or whatever the case. And then finally he said, because he had... He'd had so many different kinds of injuries and health issues and came back from everything. So that that run in California where they set the gate record at the L.A. Coliseum in 71 against Tolos, he was already not only wrestling with only one kidney, I think he had had some type of legitimate problem with his eyes, right? That they shot an angle around Tolos blinding him. And he was... 53 years old at the time that they drew the 25,000 people to the Coliseum. He had already been wrestling for over 30 years. And then the only reason he went to the WWF as a, as a manager, he was still the top baby face in the Los Angeles territory, but the athletic commission had a rule that they wouldn't license wrestlers at that point that were over 55. He turned 55 and had to leave the main event spot in California and went right to work for Vince as one of his top managers for the next, what was it, 10 years? Even longer. No, they rest, They let him wrestle. He came for, in to wrestle against Pedro. That's right. He came in as a wrestler and then transitioned to yeah. being a manager after a couple of years. So he was, he was wrestling for the WWF championship in Madison Square Garden when he was closing in on 60. He was still such a big star. Yeah, he was a bigger star in New York then than at any other point in his career. Actually, I got more. You want more? I got more. Oh, I know you do. All right. This is going to be a fun one for you. Hold on. This is a big full length program. I got to turn to the lineup page. Okay. The first event. Willie Love versus Bobby Gunter. I'm going to skip over the second event for just one second. The third event, Johnny Dobbs versus Gene Albert. Fourth match, Mario Duba versus Ken O'Connor. Why do I feel like I'm in Malden, Missouri? Next match, Frank Altman, who is billed from Seattle, Washington, against Jack Bernard, who is billed from Louisville, Kentucky. Jack Bernard. And I've never heard of it. Okay. And the main event, Irish Jack Kennedy versus Roy Dunn. Big, that's two out of three falls with a 90-minute time limit. Roy Dunn, of course, at one point was a claimant to the World Heavyweight Championship. Do you have any ideas so far? What was the second event? Well, I didn't tell you that one yet. Do you I have any, any thoughts or... or I'm nowhere First, on this. You're nowhere. 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 The second event. It Bill was actually Bill, when you, the well, early part okay. of the show, because I didn't recognize wrestler names, I really thought, like, oh, this must be one of those Henry Rogers shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know it's just way back in time. The second match on that card, with the main event of Irish Jack Kennedy against Roy Dunn, Bill Willis... Versa in one fall, 15-minute time limit contest against a fellow named Jack Atkinson. Okay. And that's the card. What time is bell time? Bell time is 8.30 p.m. Uh, any other information from the program you can give me? Well, let's see. Let's look around here. Let's see what it says. Uh, they got a down at ringside column here. Got a picture of Roy Dunn with his world championship belt posed next to Billy Sandow. 
the Billy Sandow or the fake wrestler Billy Sandow? The usually? Billy Sandow. Okay. And it says here that the promoter of this event drew outdrew his opposition promotion three to one last week in the first test of that the opposition had moved in and they drew 834 people and this promotion drew 2659 people last week in this town is this during the dallas promotional war wait a minute hold on You are correct, sir. Oh, okay. I thought that was the bad sound. No, well, I, I didn't have the other kind of music, so I thought I'd just give you... That was kind of like that, 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 you're fucked. That's it. No, <laughs> no, it wasn't wah, 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 wah. You are correct. Dallas, Texas, during the promotional war. Because Jack Atkinson being Jack Atkinson, I thought it had to be home. But then the rest of the card, I'm like, okay, there's something going on here. And this is a part of Dallas history I don't know well right now. And this is one of the reasons I wish there was a Dallas wrestling book. And this is one of the reasons I'm collecting all these Texas programs to try to figure out the entirety of the history of Texas wrestling. <sighs> Give me a year. 57. Eh, 1953. Fuck. January 13th, 1953. And there's a little article in this program on page, I believe it's, uh, is it seven? Hold on one second. The headline is, Jack Adkison debuts against Mr. Muscles' Bill Willis. This was the debut wow. of the future Fritz Von Erich wow. in the Dallas Sportatorium, January 13, 1953. I understand after that match, he got on the mic and he said, one day my kids are all going to be NWA world champions. <laughs> Hey, uh, you know, on that topic, if we could take a quick break from your game here, I got a program I just got. This is from June 13th, 63. This is one of those Leo Garibaldi Texas programs that I love. These things are just okay, the most you, gorgeous. Okay, you could have you tried me on that one. You didn't have to give me the date. Well, it's not really about the card. It's about one of the articles. What you just said reminded me of it. Next week, Bruiser Bill Watts set for debut. Big Oklahoma star. Bruiser Bill Watts out to make Oklahoma debut. Big Bill Watts, mammoth former Oklahoma University football star, is one fellow who can match the little fellows in speed and agility. Despite his huskiness, Big Bill is a speedster in the ring, and his hard-charging flying tackles really rattle the opposition's teeth. And, when Bill hoists his opponent up for a body slam, that hapless individual feels like he is going into orbit. Watts was an all-state tackle while in high school at Putnam City, Oklahoma, and it was only natural that he should attend Oklahoma University under famous gridiron coach Bud Wilkinson. Bill played with the Sooners in the Orange Bowl in 1959 when they trounced a tough Syracuse team. Who was on that team? I gotta look at that. He presently mixes professional football with his grappling. After signing a bonus contract with the Houston Oilers, he was sent to the Indianapolis Warriors in the American League. He plays tackle and defensive captain for the Warriors. Bad news for many Texas wrestlers <laughs> is that Watts intends to devote more and more of his time to the wrestling game and less and less to football. The Big O will hurl his 295 pounds of... Uh, the word of is here twice, of of muscle, into the Coliseum next Thursday, June 20th. An opponent will be announced tonight. So Bill Watts coming into Texas. Bruiser Bill Watts. That didn't last long. In Canada, he wasn't Bill Watts, he was Bill Watt, because the promoters thought Watts was too close to Watson, and you will not be anything <laughs> close to Billy Watson. How dare you? So that meant that every time they asked who was wrestling, they said, what? Yeah, who's wrestling? What? Yeah, I want to know who's on the wrestling show. What? You're going to back go back to the game now? Let's go back to the game. I got one for you here. <laughs> Please. The first event, Leo Seitz versus Bill Howard. Second event, John Tolos versus Red Bastine. Third event, 
Gordon Nelson versus El Gran Marcus. The semifinal event, Steve Strong and Jeff Ports versus Alberto Madrill and Jose Lothario. Jesus Christ. And the main event for a championship that would tip it, Mad Dog Vashon versus Superstar Billy Graham. Wow, there's a lot to this card. <laughs> for a title that would give it away. At first, I thought it could be Florida based on some of the participants, but I've ruled that out. I don't think it's California. Texas is the big suspect on my list, but so is... Well, AWA was, but actually, by the end of it, it wasn't. Based on where guys were stars at different points, Billy Graham was a star in Texas in the 70s. This is definitely early 70s. Mad Dog Vashon had been a star in Texas earlier than that. I don't remember if he came back to wrestle Billy Graham in Houston ever, but that's one of my top suspects. If it was for a title that would give it away, it wouldn't be a title in Houston, though. That would be maybe Dallas. But maybe not. If it was Los Angeles, it would be a complete giveaway. Would they have done this match in Los Angeles? Can you give me the undercard again? The undercard again, Bill Howard versus Leo Seitz. Red Bastine versus John Tolos. Grand Marcus versus Gordon Nelson. Steve Strong and Jeff Ports versus Alberto Madrill and Jose Lothario. And one more clue. The program is already promoting next week, Andre the Giant versus superstar Billy Graham. Fort Worth, Texas. 1974. Ah! 75. You were one year and 50 miles off. <sighs> was it Houston? Aug August 5, 1975, Dallas. I was going to say Dallas, and I thought Dallas would be too obvious. That's why I, why I went with Fort Worth. Sportatorium, Katie's, and Industrial. And next week, next Tuesday night, Andre here faces superstar Graham in a match and in arm wrestling. So who's the champion in that match, Graham and Vashon? The match was for the Texas Brass Knucks Championship. Oh, see, I, I would have thought Houston anyway. If you had told me that, I would have went right to Houston, actually. And by, and by the way, folks, the, the Texas Brass Knucks Championship, that is a match without disqualifications where punches are legal. And there must be a winner. Do they have a picture of the trophy? They do not. They don't have the trophy. Because they didn't have a belt. They had a trophy they a with belt, the a brass knuckles yeah. on it. How do you book that, though? You're bringing Andre in to wrestle Billy Graham, assuming he beats Mad Dog Vashon and retains the title or wins the title, whatever it was. But they're going to arm wrestle, too. Yes. Well, in the arm wrestling, they do the arm wrestling first. Graham starts kind of strong, but Andre gets him as he's almost beat. Graham turns the table over. Wax Andre with the table or the chair, takes off. Andre's mad. People can't wait to see the fucking main event. Finally, the main event gets in the fucking ring. Andre gets even. Graham gets some fucking juice. But some way or another, and I don't even know because I don't know, I don't have the books here in front of me with the finishes, but I would imagine that uh, since Graham was the top heel, that Graham would have tried to save himself by doing something crazy. And getting disqualified and Andre making a comeback and running him off and him taking off. That's the way you'd do that. And people would have loved it. I got one more for you. You want one more? Yeah, this is fun. You got to you gotta have one more here. This, this might be a little test for you here. Okay. And it's advertised that every bout is a wind-up. Could have been a main event anywhere in the country. A wind-up, by the way, used to be what they called the main event, the last match, winding it up. I was going to say a wind-up kind of puts in my head a certain time period it would certainly be before. So, the opening match, Elmer Estep versus Jim Austeri. 
The second match was scheduled to be Pat Welch versus Tony Martinelli. But according to the handwritten notes on this document, Martinelli was replaced by Rudy Dusick. Next match, according to the notes, the best bout of the evening, Art Legrand versus Sandor Zabo. When you say notes, the person who owned the program left notes in it about the actual quality of the matches? Yes. Wow. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, um, in the Rudy Dusick versus Pat Welch match, the note is, Rudy really fixed him. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the semifinal... Reb Russell versus Yvonne Robert. Oh. The notes were Yvonne Robert was a neat guy. And Reb Russell, it says he was dirty too. He had tape on his arm and kept rubbing it on Yvonne's eyes. Yvonne took it off him and rubbed it in his eyes. <laughs> Think about how what a big pop that Spot probably got back then. Fucking caused a riot. <laughs> and the main event, two out of three falls, 90-minute time limit, described as what about Vic Christie versus Emil Dusick, who was described as dirty as the devil himself. So you got Jim Osteri against Elmer Estep, Tony Martinelli replaced by Rudy Dusick against Pat Welsh, Art Legrand against Sandor Zabo, Reb Russell and Yvonne Robert and Emil Dusick and Vic Christie. The fact that there's a Dusick in the main event and another Dusick just around to be thrown into the card, I don't know if it's too simple to think it would be Omaha. And a lot of fans don't, probably don't realize that Omaha, Nebraska was actually once a thriving wrestling town, not just the middle of nowhere. Sorry if you live there, by the way. <laughs> <Please> <laughs> that. Oof. Year is going to be tough. Omaha, Nebraska. I'm going to go with Omaha. Just because I don't have anything else that's a better pick right now. And I'm going to go with 1951. March 12, 1945, in Camden, New Jersey. Really? Camden, New Jersey. Wow. And they're in. it's a four-page foldover, and there's a column called Radio Alley, uh, which talks about, I guess, the radio reports of the matches and et cetera, and says hello to a lot of the fans that come by to the live events. And it says, Alley Gossip. The band leader, who was scheduled to be interviewed, was sidestepped in last week's broadcast because the wind-up was a one-fall affair, but I'm going to endeavor to get him on the air this time. The band leader, who was going to be interviewed on the wrestling radio program, was named Pat Patterson. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they basically... They did radio uh, uh, calls of the wrestling matches, and that served as their promotional vehicle instead of television. And also, if you pick the, the three people who pick the winner and come closest in judging the time of the fall on Christie and Emil Dusick, will each receive two ringside tickets with the compliments of the promoter. So I was thinking it would be a little bit later, and I was thinking it was. I mean, speaking of the promoter, I was thinking it was them. Uh, and Camden Beer sponsors broadcast abouts each Monday at 10 p.m. on WCAM 1310 on your radio dial. If you collect wrestling programs, you will find out about more defunct breweries and beers than you could <laughs> ever imagine. And in Camden, apparently in 1945, there was a 12 o'clock closing law. So the... Matches had to end at 11.45, and that was the curfew, so that the patrons could be out of the building by midnight. If a match was still going on, they rang the bell and stopped it. Is that something a promoter wants, in the sense that it gives you an out, it lets you do things with the booking? Do you like when there is something like that, an automatic end that's out of your control and everyone knows it? Yes, because... Remember, they used to do that in the garden, right? In the 70s? Curfew, yeah. 
I mean, at 11.45, if your show has gone three hours and 15 minutes, it needs to be stopped by the city authorities. You know, for fuck's sake, especially when, you know, in the old days, you only had five or six matches, if that. So, I mean, if it was, if you know about it ahead of time, as a wrestling promoter, you're not going to let a mandatory curfew fuck up your main event because you know about it ahead of time. But what they used to do back in the garden days was they'd put the main event on earlier in the night anyway so that the uh, the main event for the next show could be advertised before the people left the building and also so the heel that fucked with Bruno could get out of there before he had to fight the crowd. And the curfew would generally stop some tag match that went on last anyway and people were already leaving to, to beat the traffic or whatever. So... Yeah, I mean, you know, a mandatory curfew sounds like something that would fuck with wrestling, but if it was 10 o'clock at night, your show starts at 7.30 or 8, I can see, but no, not... If you had a midnight curfew and it still fucked your show up, you're a fucking idiot. And amazing, too, when you think about some of the shows that did not have that. You know, you hear those legends about those Texas shows with Dory Funk Sr. How long did they say he wrestled for? Legitimately, like the Texas death match that went hours and hours and people. Well, were yeah, but, but but see, also the thing is they got that thing to the point where they only advertised the Texas death match and then they would advertise standby matches on the card because the people knew, oh, Dory Funk Sr. is having a Texas death match with Cyclone Negro or whoever the fuck that could be. That could last two or three hours. So to build on that mythology of the Texas death match, they advertise that and sometimes only advertise standby matches in case there was time. But they really, they put the time in. It wasn't like shaving for an hour Broadway. They had, it was specifically, they were out in public in front of people for an hour at 44 falls and an hour and 44 minutes or whatever it was. And by doing that, the legend grew. You know, I'm sure it was up, but I'd love to know what the next week really was. The next time they returned there with the rematch after that. Yeah, but, well, probably people were still there. They were so tired out from, uh, but it, hey, I got one more here. I got one more. Hey, you said right. the other one was one more. Well, I got, but I got one more because this will be fun. Okay. I think this will be fun. Unlike this the other is, ones. Right. Unlike the other ones, which were miserable for you. Because this one, you got folks from all over the place. The opening match. And this uh, apparently had something, to, uh, a military connotation. I've never seen one of these people advertised this way before. But Stu Gibson, Colonel Stu Gibson of Louisville, Kentucky, against Sergeant Sam Steamboat of Hawaii. Now, Stu Gibson was uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, and he was a local guy, and he was a Kentucky colonel. I don't think he was a colonel in the army, but he was a Kentucky colonel. But did you ever hear of Sam Steamboat being a sergeant? No, and I'm not saying that isn't true, but I certainly have never heard that, no. So, but but in this case, Colonel Stu Gibson versus Sergeant Sam Steamboat. Second event, and this is a misprint. I'm going to tell you what's written, and then you're already probably going to know who it is. But from Samoa, Chief Ava. Versus Rip Rogers. <laughs> third fall, or third fall, third match. Enrique Torres versus Cato. What? Cato? <laughs> okay. Obviously, it says Enrique Torres from Palo Duro, California versus Cato from Japan. And, and as I said, Chief Ava is from Samoa. Rip Rogers, by the way, built from Florida. Next match. And this Cato, for the record, would have predated the TV the show. Green, that's well, right. Well, it would have predated the TV show, but not the radio show. Oh, that's true. That's Green true. Hornet's been on the radio since the 30s. Fourth match. Larry Shane from Detroit versus Fritz Von Erich from Waterpool, New York. <laughs> Larry Shane is the favorite wrestler of Dave Brzezinski. I believe he actually lived upstairs from Dave Brzezinski. That's one yeah. of the reasons Dave became a big wrestling fan. One of the huge babyface, leaping Larry Shane, was yeah. a huge babyface in the Midwest. Detroit was killed in a car wreck at the height of his career. 
semifinal event, Hartford, Connecticut's own Bull Curry against El Medico from Mexico City. And the main event for a championship that is not the one that you think, Luthez from St. Louis versus Johnny Valentine from Washington State. Two out of three falls, 90-minute time limit. Okay. There was something you said earlier that made me think Texas, but I've said that about just about every single program you've mentioned today so far. <laughs> Rip Rogers made me think Texas. Rip Rogers, not the famous Rip Rogers who curses a lot and knows how to train wrestlers, but Eddie Graham broke into the business. Well, not broke in, but the first real break he got was his Rip Rogers in Texas from Dory Funk Sr. Right. Sam Steamboat wrestled in Texas, although I never heard of him as Sergeant Sam Steamboat. Bull Curry, major star in Texas. There's a title that would give it away. Well, the title would give away the time, the, the year, if not necessarily the location. Johnny Valentine's a big star in Texas. Give me a couple of the matches again. Stu Gibson versus Sam Steamboat, Colonel right. versus Sergeant. Chief Ava would not be Chief Peter Maivia, but Chief Neff Mava versus Rip Rogers. And, of course, Chief Neff Mava was the only Samoan that anybody knew in wrestling, so when Peter Maivia needed a Samoan name, that, 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 that's how they... But they didn't know how to spell it either. Or pronounce it. Yeah, so it or just pronounce became it. Maivia. Uh, Enrique Torres against Keto. Larry Shane versus Fritz Von Erich, Waterpool, New York's favorite son. Bull Curry, El Medico, Luthez, Johnny Valentine. El Medico. I'm going with Houston, Texas. Bull Curry versus El Medico. Houston, Texas. If it's not Houston, it's a fucking other Texas show you're trying to hit me with. <laughs> Johnny Valentine was a big star there. He's the champion going into this match with Fez. Houston was one of the few places, even more so than Tennessee, that did gimmick matches. So the idea that there's a military match on the show kind of, even though it's the undercard, I mean, usually they actually did gimmick matches for the main event. Like real gimmick matches, like loser rides a donkey. Or, you know, <laughs> loser rides a donkey <laughs> down Main Street. Like crazy shit. I'm going with Houston, Texas. 1959. And ladies and gentlemen, oh, by the way, hold on here. Update. Sam Steamboat is stationed at Fort Hood. So he was in huh? the service and was stationed at Fort Hood. And we are in Texas, but we're back at the Dallas Sportatorium. God, I didn't think you'd hit me with Dallas twice. God. April 8, 1958. And think about this. I was one the year reason, off. The reason why I said the title would give you the date is because this was Luthez defending the international world title Oh, against Johnny Valentine. He had already dropped the belt to Hutton. Yeah. But this was, he, in, in addition to going overseas to defend the international title that he created for himself because everybody around the world, all the wrestling fans, News traveled slower in those days, and people didn't realize that Thez was no longer the world champion. He dropped the NWA belt on purpose to his hand-picked successor, Dick Hutton, who didn't draw 15 cents in Chinese money, but was an NCAA wrestling champion, so Thez would do a job to him for him. And then Thez named himself the international champion and did an international tour for more money than he'd make with the NWA title. And he came back here and defended the, the international title. And the, the headline is, Great Luthez puts new world title up against Big Valentine. International world title won by Thez goes to the main event winner. And this is Dallas. That means and this, this is, is Dallas. This is happening with the permission of the NWA. Yes, because Hutton wasn't fucking drawing 15 cents in Chinese money. That's the worst thing Thez ever did, really, was insist on Hutton. And, you know, things end up kind of working out in a way in the end. But when you think about the different people he could have dropped it to, Vern Gagne, Buddy Rogers. I mean, there were various candidates that 
would have been be- anyone would have been better than Dick Hutton. Benito yeah. Gardini would have been better than Dick <laughs> Hutton in terms of at least being a wrestling star. But Thaz did. He wasn't worried about who was the biggest star. He was worried about I'm if I'm going to do a job, it's going to be somebody that can really legitimately fucking stand a chance of beating me, or otherwise, fuck it. Good luck. I haven't seen much Dick Hutton based on anything you've ever seen or heard. More specifically. Was it like a Dan Severn situation in terms of trying to convert a wrestler into a pro wrestler? What was he like in the ring? Did he have any good qualities in the ring? Like, what have you heard about Dick Hutton from anyone you've ever asked about him? Well, from from what I can tell, Dan Severn was Nature Boy Ric Flair compared to oh wow Dick. Hutton. Well, it just that was the thing. I mean, Dan understood that there was a show business aspect, and Dan had also had a you know, tremendous background in professional sports and the UFC and et cetera, et cetera. Hutton legitimately won the NCAA title and was one of the highest ranking amateur wrestlers in collegiate wrestling in the United States, but then turned pro and basically, what was it? Two years later, he Thez puts the belt on him. He was still green. He was boring. He could wrestle and he had the size, but there was no person. I mean, look at the pictures of him standing there. He doesn't even have a fucking facial expression. He was the original Dick same face, right? You know, it and almost it, looks like he's from another era. It almost looks like he was transported yeah. from wrestling 20 years earlier. And that's probably why Thez was in love with him. But, <laughs> yeah, really. But that's but he never he never got it and he never caught on and you know, he he had no personality, no showbiz, no charisma. He couldn't build the match. You know, he I mean, it's not Dan the Beast Severn. Dan had a nickname. Dan understood building, hyping fights. Uh, but no, it was just Hutton was... Nah. And he, after he had that little run, what we wasn't more than a year and lost the belt, he was out of the business pretty quickly, right? Yeah. Did he, I mean, he stayed mostly wrestling around his home area for a little while, and then you didn't hear his name again. And that may be an interesting question to a, or interesting, interesting answer to a trivia question. To a Hutton Torian. To a Hutton Torian. He is the only NWA world heavyweight champion in the history of wrestling that within what, just a couple of years after he was the champion, he was out of the business completely and was in, not in any demand to be booked anywhere. <laughs> it, it just, that's, it was what it was, right? It's amazing there weren't more defections from the promoters during that year. And there, and there were a bunch. The NWA lost members, and that's why... It's amazing there weren't more, quite yeah. frankly. Well, they, that's when they just started, you know, well, we won't drop out of the NWA. We'll just name our own champion. And the other regional champions started sprouting up. And that's why they had to go ahead and go with O'Connor and then Rogers to get the, all the promoters back in the fold because, you know, they could draw money with those guys. They couldn't draw any money with Hutton. Well, do you think Dick Hutton used Manscaped products? <laughs> Before his big matches. <laughs> it honestly doesn't look like he did. He he looks like one of those guys that, that was born shaved. Um, but folks, <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to shave Dick Hutton's crotch, uh, you know, here's the problem. We talk about this all the time, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages out there, is the swamp rot in your crotch and the shave in your balls and your taint and your sphincter. And, and the summertime is the time for landscaping and or manscaping because taking control of your bush is important. Whether it's the bush you've got between your legs or the bush you've, you're married to or the bushes in your yard. You, you, sometimes you want the bush you're married to out in your yard. You want a yard bush inside and you don't know what you want to do with your own bush. I'd whack the whole thing down. What? But folks, the products at Manscaped are so good. You're going to be showing pride in your new bush free, weed free yard or playground. You'll have the best kept nut sack on the cul-de-sac. No pesticides. 
No pesticides in this stuff. You just shave it right off. You don't spray it and let it wither and die. Because Lord knows you don't want things withering and dying down in between your legs. But you can right now go to manscaped.com and look at the Performance Package 4.0, the incredible Lawnmower 4.0, the electric trimmer that is a an unruly groin bush's worst nightmare. The trimmer is designed to reduce grooming accidents, shave hair on loose skin. You know, there is no ball machine at the gym. You really can't tighten that stuff up. If you were born with a wrinkly coin purse, that's the way you're going to die. They do droop a little bit more in old age. Manscaped, the Performance Package 4.0, has the Lawnmower 4.0 and other care items. But if your balls are drooping down around about the area of your knees, if you've reached that age, you might have to find a sling somewhere else. Manscaped is taking charge of the cleanliness and the smelly goodness of your coin purse, but certainly not the the swinging d- dissension of it. You know, like one of those bridges that blows in the wind. They just flap to and fro. Anyway, the second best tool, it, almost, it would almost hypnotize you. You get an 80-year-old man... <laughs> And you strip him naked and you push him to the side no, just a little no, bit. No, don't do that. And Why would balls, anyone do that? Just not enough to knock him over, just to get him <laughs> wiggling. And the balls will swing and it it looks like the pendulum. You know, the balls of time. No. But anyway, the second best tool in the performance package is the weed whacker. Because it's a fine-tuned nose and ear hair trimmer to make sure you... You can cut down those nasty no- nose pubes. That's what they call them. The nose pubes, the hair you got coming out of there, it's it's unsightly. And you can also add some pep in your step with the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Spray-On Testy Toner. And if you right now go to manscaped.com and use that code DRIVE, to purchase a performance package. Well, with your perfunctory performance package purchase, you will get absolutely free, that means you pay nothing, two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the patented high-performance chafing-reducing Manscaped boxers. But there's a bunch of other products on the website to help you maximize your aroma and minimize the stank coming from your nether regions, all you got to do is go to manscaped.com, use the code DRIVE, and you'll get 20% off and free shipping. Again, 20% off and free shipping, manscaped.com. Use the code DRIVE. It's time to get rid of the Amazon and make your dong amazing with the ultimate bushwhacking tools from our friends at Manscaped.